So one of the things that uh, I mentioned yesterday, I brought this up a couple of times, is uh, this this plot by Tim Baker, Tim Baker, which is the accuracy versus ease of use for uh, different meshing techniques. And uh, multi-block structured meshing is real up, really up there on the accuracy side, but not so much the ease of use side. And there's a couple of reasons for this, like we talked about yesterday, is that um, in terms of ease of use, just defining a topology that supports the geometry that you have can be very challenging. Um, but that's one problem. The other problem is defining a topology that no, not only supports the geometry, but also supports the flow field that you're looking to resolve. It turns out we've, we've done some experiments for just uh, advection type problems and looking at skewness and orthogonality and things like that for just 2D um, quad meshes and triangular meshes. And uh, it's been shown that a sheared quad mesh that's flow aligned is actually okay. But as soon as you rotate that mesh and introduce some, some non-flow alignment, uh, the, the solution tends to break down. Okay. Uh, so that's actually one of the really uh, challenging parts with creating a multi-block structured mesh. It's not just decomposing the computational volume into a collection of these blocks. It's decomposing it in a way such that you retain this, this flow alignment. And that's what turbo machinery guys are able to do very well because they have these topologies kind of defined, uh, these nice blocking strategies, and that's why multi-block structured meshing is still uh, heavily used in the turbo machinery industry. Now, hybrid... Uh, hex prism tet meshes kind of in the in the middle here um, also pose their own challenges but they're high in terms of ease of use and kind of high up there in terms of accuracy it's almost better in cases where you're not certain of what the flow looks like to start by using an unstructured mesh and the reason for that is it turns out that an unstructured mesh is relatively insensitive to the flow alignment okay it doesn't matter I mean the, the unstructured mesh is kind of disorganized anyway it's it's unstructured it's relatively less sensitive to that flow alignment. So you can get by with using a much finer unstructured surface mesh and save yourself the time in areas where you're not certain what the flow is going to look like. Okay. Not to mention that if you use a, high, a true hybrid technique like what we're using, in the boundary layer region those cells will be relatively flow aligned and you'll get that benefit as well. So there's a couple of metrics uh, that I want to mention and then we'll look at some of them in point-wise. Now, the first two I mentioned, you're not going to be able uh, to look at uh, directly and point-wise, but you'll be able to look at some of, their, um, some of their relatives. The first one is orthogonality. Orthogonality is defined as the, uh, the angle, theta, in this example. Uh, that angle is the, the angle between the vector connecting two adjacent cell centers and the face normal vector. The larger this angle, the worse the grid, um, unless you have a correction built in like, like SU2 where it can relatively, it can handle these, these, uh, these situations a little bit better um, when there's a correction built in. The idea is that uh, you want these things to be aligned for the computation of the gradient. The other metric to look at is skewness. So skewness is going to affect the convective term. Now this is just a, an illustration of like the sharp trailing edge of an airfoil, for example, with two quad elements and a single normal, stuff that we saw in a couple of images already. And uh, how this is defined is if you if you connected two adjacent cell centers and noted the location where that pierces the face, it's the distance between that location and the face center. The larger that location, the worse the interpolation. Uh, higher order methods exist to mitigate this, larger stencils. Um, vertex centered schemes inherently have larger stencils than a cell centered scheme, so it turns out that skewness isn't as much of a problem with a vertex centered code. So that's kind of why I was asking what are some of the advantages of going with a vertex centered, and this is kind of what I've heard. Is there a little bit less sensitive to skewness for this reason? Okay, so some of the metrics that you can look at in point-wise. One of them is equiangle skew. Equiangle skew is essentially the deviation uh, from an isotropic state. So we have, a, uh, we have an isotropic triangle, 60 degree internal angles, and then an anisotropic triangle that has high equiangle skew uh, because of its deviation from that isotropic state. Centroid skew looks very familiar, uh, very similar to orthogonality. It's uh, computed on a cell by cell basis and uh, basically it's kind of the angular deviation uh, between that vector connecting the cell center to the face center and the face normal vector. And for uh, some applications like this where you've got two right angle triangles 
it's uh, if you extend that vector to the adjacent cell center, it's equivalent to orthogonality. We've talked a little about a uh, little bit about this already. The area to volume ratio. Uh, the larger this ratio, you'll get some inconsistent interpolation error. It's good to keep this relatively low. Um, my limit on the surface is about three to four. Uh, similarly for the volume, um, so I try to keep this pretty low. And you'll also notice that when I did all of my extrusions, I used a growth rate of about 1.2. The aspect ratio, you can see that the aspect ratio is simply defined as the max edge length uh, over the min edge length. So this is an aspect ratio for a quad. If it were a triangle, it would be the diagonal, it would be the max edge length um, over the min edge length. And then min-max angles, this is one of my favorite to look at in point-wise because I can, I can visualize this a little bit easier. It's the maximum included angle for a given cell. So you can see in the top, um, that's the max angle at the bottom, that's the min angle. It kind of lets me know how flat uh, a given cell is. So I should probably mention that um, you know, these are computed on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. Um, with uh, SU2 being vertex-centered, uh, th these are computed basically on the primal grid. Um, not the dual grid that uh, they're using for the computation. But the idea is that if you can kind of optimize and improve the quality of your primal grid, you'll also be optimizing and improving the quality of the resulting dual grid. So these are, these are still very relevant and very important. All right, so the mesh is done. There's 11.8 million elements. So why don't we take a look at one of those metrics. So I've selected the block. I'm going to examine. You'll notice there's a lot of different metrics we can look at. And the one that I'm going to look at is maximum included angle. All right, so I'm going to uh, see the maximum is 173. And the histogram shows me that the majority of the elements kind of lie down in this region, which is really good. And I'm going to turn the maximum down to about 165. And some of those cells will start to pop up on the screen. And if I zoom in here, and we take a look at some of these elements, like, for example, there's one right there. There's a few down there you can kind of see floating around. Um, the reason those exist is because those are in collision regions. So what this kind of helps you identify are regions like that. Um, they may help you also identify other areas that you didn't necessarily know existed. Uh, maybe we messed up another spacing on the surface, for example. We can use this to uh, go back to the surface mesh, improve it, and then regenerate the volume and take a look at the quality again. So the point I really want to make here is that there's a lot of different metrics you can look at. Different solvers expect different things. Um, and you have the ability to look at all of them here and kind of help you optimize the, the quality of your resulting mesh. OK. The last thing I want to do is set this thing up for the solver and then set up the FFD box for the spinner. But maybe before I do that, I've been talking for a little while. We should answer some questions. No, no questions for you. Okay. All right. Should we uh, go over some of the metrics that were pertinent to this report? You know, based off uh, directly the ones mentioned here, uh, you know, honestly, we, we don't do a whole lot of diagnostics directly on the, the metrics. but. I mean, I think what Travis is saying are the typical ones are important. So looking at units, um, looking. So I, I did want to actually while you were talking, there was one thought I wanted to, to share is that I also do definitely encourage folks when they export these T-Rex type meshes to combine the anisotropic tests and prisms. We do like to have normals or orthogonal to the surface. We don't necessarily like to have diagonal edges uh, in the boundary layer meshes off the surface. So I definitely do encourage that for SU2. Um, I'm trying to think of other things we, we focus on while we're exporting meshes, but uh, that, that's the biggest one. Definitely uh, take advantage of the recombining the tests into anisotropic tests into uh, prisms. That's very valuable. Can you just show what the mesh looks like through the propeller disc there? Uh, yeah. is, it, is it marching with the viscous layer off that propeller disc, or what is it? Do you want to see it in point wise, or do you want me to go back to that slide? Uh, okay. We're here. Let's take a look at it. So it didn't mark the viscous mesh off the, off the prop? No. That was just the kind of Yep. Yep. 
you could you could set it to march off of it if you wanted to, um, but in this case it wasn't necessary. So all those weird things are all like errors and no, not necessarily errors. The the red elements that you see, those are basically just uh, elements that violate this uh, upper bound that I specify. So not necessarily errors. This mesh is still a very high quality, but it's just helping me understand um, some of the regions where there might be collisions and things like that. Okay. So let's go ahead and set this thing up for uh, export to SU2. So I'm going to uh, set the solver. It's already set, actually, if I look down here, 3D SU2. Uh, if I go to set boundary conditions, I've already created my boundary conditions, but we can drop the, uh, the appropriate domains in there. So I'll just grab all of the aircraft domains and put them in the aircraft BC. I'm going to uh, turn on select connections. And uh, here's the interesting thing. Um, the prop is considered a connection in terms of boundary condition. What that means is that uh, we can effectively, if we want to run this without an actuator disk, just don't set any boundary conditions on the prop, and it'll simply disappear into the interior of the mesh. Those points on that disk just become internal grid points that we've imposed. Um, if we elect to uh, run this as an actuator disk, I need to set some boundary conditions on it. And so I can toggle on select connections. I can specify, uh, for example, uh, that one and that one both normals pointing out. Um, I put that in a BC called prop upstream. The uh, other two, basically those two that are pointing downstream, I put those in a separate boundary condition called prop downstream. And uh, the last one is the far field, but instead of zooming out and selecting it, I know that it's the last two that are here unspecified. I can click add to selection and drop it into the far field boundary condition. And then I am finished. All I need to do is grab that block, go file, export CAE and I can export it to SU2. Okay, the next thing you'd probably like to do is set up an FFD box for the spinner. 